All right, good morning, guys. Um, my name is Sherry Matkin. I am the Director of Technical Implementations at Availity. I'm joined on stage by, on stage by Steve Coase. He is the Director of Revenue Cycle Application Support at Baptist Health, and Jay Sandhouse, the CTO at Rhyme. Um, so if you caught Matt Cunningham's presentation yesterday about prior authorizations and why it's not ideal use case for interoperability and automation, we're going to talk about the case study that Availity, Rhyme, and um, Baptist have put into play and what we started with as far as the challenges, how they got the strategy together, how they built the use case, and then where we're at now looking at optimization and um, metrics and, and how we move forward. I'm going to skip through some of these pretty quickly. All right. So, Steve, I'm going to start it off with you. So, from a Baptist perspective, why did you choose prior authorizations? What challenges were you facing that, that made this seem like the right route to go down? Because it's, it's intense with resource allocation and funding. And you Absolutely. want to talk about that? So, yeah, for, for us, it's all about looking for ways to improve our operational throughput throughout the revenue cycle space itself. So we did an assessment of what could we automate internally, leveraging our EHR versus what are the big wins that we could get with third party vendors uh, and automate uh, externally. And of the top five, prior off rose to the top, uh, probably was number two on our list of opportunities that could really move the needle uh, in reducing administrative burden. If you look at how prior auth is done manually, uh, you have multiple portals to log into. You have a lot of different variabilities in terms of what has to be supplied, so education is a challenge. And you have uh, personnel who are just trying to navigate it, get logged in, put in the required information, uh, likely they don't get the status right away, so go back in, check it again. Uh, notice that they have to supply clinical information or additional information somewhat to be, to be able to satisfy the auth. And uh, you know, finally, maybe to having to pick up the phone and, and get it clarified that way. All in all, the time studies show that it was about a 15 to 20 minute process for some of these authorizations to get pushed through. So, have to reduce that burden. We have to do that across revenue cycle because one of the things that we definitely need to concentrate on is just being an advocate for the patient. Uh, patients are having a hard time navigating the systems, getting into our network, um, and helping them to do that timely is really what we have to do. We have to have faster turnaround on these authorizations and appointments to give them the type of attention that they deserve and uh, the opportunity to receive great care. Yeah, and Jay, from a Rhyme perspective, so authorizations in the past have been looked at as cumbersome and, and difficult and just not an ideal use case. This is Rhyme's specialty. So what, from an industry perspective, why why did you choose prior auths? Why, did, why do you see this as an ideal use case? Right, well, we see the, the problems that Steve was just describing at Baptist are problems we see everywhere, large hospital systems, small hospital systems, individual providers across the entire industry. Uh, this very Im important process as part of understanding financial preclearance is really um, requires the exchange and harmonization of a lot of information between both the payer and the provider. And it's not one provider and one payer, it's not Baptist and Florida Blue, for example. It may be between a, uh, a lot of different individuals inside of a system like Baptist that are producing the information. Uh, say a doctor who's ordering a service in one group may be working very differently than a doctor who's ordering a service in another group and therefore generating completely different information that needs to be exchanged. And the same thing is happening on the payer side. On the payer side, you know, uh, we might think of a particular payer as monolithic in deciding prior authorizations, but in fact, they're using a lot of different systems internally and externally to decide whether or not a particular service is going to be covered, and if it is covered, does it need a prior authorization ahead of time. So we wanted to take a systems approach to solving this problem that Steve is familiar with that really bedevils the entire industry, where um, 
it's very hard to compare a provider's view of the world and a payer's view of the world and really put those two pieces together in a, in a reproducible, systemic, low-touch, efficient way so that the, those two parties can work together to do what they really want to do, which is get care to the patient as quickly as possible. And so we have taken uh, a systems approach to doing that, where we looked, as you can see, as we sort of laid out, there are several variables we want to solve for. We want to solve for burden reduction. We want to take away the human effort that goes into prior authorization, because this really is a, a human process, unfortunately, right now. We want to help the patient. We want to reduce um, time to care. So when humans are involved in copying information out of the EMR, reading it, distilling it, typing it in, that is an impediment to the patient getting care as quickly as possible. And I think all of us as consumers have had this experience. You get injured or something else happens. You go to the doctor. The doctor orders an MRI. You walk past the MRI machine. There may not be anybody in there. But the doctor tells you, go home, we'll get this scheduled a week from now. <laughs> and they're not doing that because they have a hard time filling up the MRI or because there's not space there. They're doing that because they know an army of humans are going to have to go have conversations with each other on the payer side and the provider side to connect the dots and get to the point where they can be assured they're going to be paid for that service. So we're trying to actively work hard to take that time away. And finally, we really, um, the, the, uh, there is a medical purpose to prior authorization. There's a quality purpose to make sure that patients are getting the best possible quality care. And that happens best when the quality of the information being submitted is very high. So we want to make sure that as we move people out of the process and replace them with machines, those, um, the machines are doing a better job than the people can at extracting the highest quality information that allows the payer and the provider to connect their different views of the world. And in real time, because this is all happening in real time, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go here, in real time, we want, uh, we want the patient to get the answer. Yes, you can have the service now. Don't come back next week. Go, to, go over to the MRI office and get that service today. Steve, did you face any pushback from, you know, like Jay was talking about, this is very human-based, right? Did you receive pushback from any of the clinicians or the UM review team that just had some hesitation about introducing automation into their, their workflow, or were people pretty agreeable? I think the, uh, the workforce was very agreeable to it. Um, they welcomed the fact that the process would be streamlined, mm -hmm. easier to navigate, um, and ultimately, they receive satisfaction out of, out of doing other things instead of focusing on the technique, if you will, of, of getting a yeah. prior authorization achieved. Yeah. So let's talk about the solution. What'd we do? So for Baptist, it was extremely important to stay within Epic. We all know that the more you have to log out of systems, move into another portal, things like that, there's abrasion there, right? And they're gonna revert back to the normal, comfortable methods. So what we did is we started with Epic. So they're creating the order in Epic. That's coming over to Rhyme. So Rhyme is then consuming that information. There's a user interface within Rhyme that's a deep link out of Epic. They're going into that user interface. They can correct any data that may not have come over or you know any discrepancies that are there. The biggest piece that we're looking for within Rhyme is uploading that clinical documentation. So we know that the approval percentage is much higher on that first time when we're receiving that clinical documentation. That's something that does take some, some training and some education with the team, right? Because it's, you know, you have, you have people that have done prior authorizations 15, 20 years. They know these policies way better than any of us, right? They know that I may not have had to submit clinical documentation before on it. Um, but once that documentation is in there, then Rhyme is coming over to Availity. All of this is happening either through X12, APIs, um, we've got some fire built in, but once that comes over to Availity, we're consuming that clinical documentation and this is where the AI comes in. So now we have that payer's medical policies, we're presenting clinical attestation questions, the submitter is completing those questions, 
but we're taking that question of is this medically necessary using the clinical documentation that was uploaded at the time. So we're not using generative AI. We're looking at it and comparing it side by side. And we're able to make a recommendation to the payer based off of the clinical documentation. So when we talk about quality of submissions, that's the biggest area where we want to focus is getting those clinicals better so that you can leverage the AI, right? Once it goes over and we have that recommendation, we send that on to the payer and take that all the way back, reverse it all the way back. By that point, Steve now has his team seeing the status, that current status, the initial response. With an 80% approval rate that we're seeing, a lot of that could be a first time approval, right? So it changes that, that care from sending that patient home, like what, what Jay was saying, to 90 seconds, I've got an approval and I can go ahead and get them scheduled and I'm gonna get better compliance with that patient care. Jay or Steve, anything you guys want to add on on the, the solution that we put forth? And Yeah, I, I, I believe that the solution not only helps you in those instances where it's touchless, enable, uh, so you don't have to look at those transactions to get an authorization, but it also allowed us to schedule first and get the authorization later because we had confidence yep. that we'll get the authorization in time. Um, and another thing that, that's important to point out here, because of that interaction with the solution, that conversation, if you will, of solving what's necessary to get the off satisfied, totally reduces your denials possibility on the back end. Mm -hmm. Whereas a manual process, that variability is, is going to always be there. So we yep. have seen some help there in terms of reduction of our denials. Yeah. Jay, within the solution, people talk about, you know, the administrative portion is quite objective. It's, it's data entry, right? But then when we get to the clinical, it's more of a conversation. So you want to talk a little bit, bit about that and how, you know, there is this idea of touchless, but maybe more utopic than we realize, right? Yeah. Um, at least at this point until we right. leverage automation even further. Yeah, I think there are a couple concepts that are really important to think about here. Uh, you sort of put the right pin in the ground. The destination for prior auth is touchless, right? That's the utopia for prior auth, is this happens um, in real time, behind the scenes, no humans involved. That's uh, clearly not the world we live in today. And we don't, I, uh, there's not a uh, one size fits all solution that takes us from where we are now to where we wanna be. So it's very important to, for us to create um, a set of tools that support iterative progress towards that goal, as Sherry is describing, right? So what we don't wanna say it's all or nothing, which is kind of what you get in, in many cases in the system today. Everything works, or you're picking up the phone and you're calling somebody, you're back to the fax machine. That's, uh, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a system where when something goes wrong, we can identify the very small thing that went wrong and surface only the work the human needs to do to fix that problem and to keep going. And that's why when you look at this uh, diagram on the screen, I think it's tempting to think of this just as a series of handoffs, mm -hmm. but it's really both in the administrative and in the clinical portion of a prior auth. It's this very complicated conversation with a lot of, uh, a lot of participants engaged at once without clean interfaces to talk to one another. Mm -hmm. There aren't great APIs at any layer in this stack, unfortunately. The industry has really treated the 278, like X12, as the interface for that. And where people have built interfaces, like APIs, they are, um, they are really generally proprietary towards them and don't really consider all of the functional mechanics of a prior authorization. So in, in order to make all of this work, we, we can't just think of it as a series of handoffs that either all work or all don't. We instead have to think of it as a conversation with lots and lots of little breakpoints or stopping points where we need to treat it like a single workflow where we can involve the humans only at the moment the humans need to be involved. And if we're successful at doing that and we have a process for iteratively moving from fully manual all the way to touchless, which is where we are a lot of the time today, mm -hmm. by looking at things that go wrong and providing small tools for fixing them when they do go wrong, over time we can reach that utopia and we will get there. We've made a lot of progress just in the last few years 
and I think it probably clear because of who you see sitting here talking together, but we, we have a strong point of view that that is only going to happen if it's observable, so we can see it and have a shared understanding, and if we're all at the table, if we're all working together. This doesn't work when it's just a provider trying to automate the work. There's no way for a provider to automate away a handshake when there's not a hand on the other side to shake with. So it's really important. That's why it's, it's so great working with Baptist, with Availity, and with a lot of payers directly, because when we all sit down and talk about these problems together, when we agree we're going to observe what's going on and we're going to fix it in real time, and then we put resources towards doing it, we get outcomes like this, where we're uh, demonstrably and measurably removing an enormous amount of burden and creating a path or a roadmap to remove the rest. So Steve, let's talk about some of the outcomes. So obviously you guys set goals. We needed to make sure that the, the juice was worth the squeeze, right? Talk about what those goals were and have, have we met them and what you're looking at. Share the outcomes as well? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, when we looked at this, we did a SWOT analysis of our approach and, and, and whether or not we should even invest externally uh, versus in, try to do it yourself. And a lot of things that Jay mentioned there complicates doing it yourself. But for us, it, we're, we didn't have an automation platform. We didn't have the resources. We didn't have the expertise. Uh, so to get to speed to value, uh, it just came out looking as if the best way, best approach would be to seek out a, a uh, platform that is a partnership with an organization and put it in play. Um, ultimately, our goals from the SWOT analysis was to reduce our cost to, to uh, collect, uh, make certain that uh, we are continuing to look at the process, even though we have automated a portion of it, um, and assess if we can continue to improve. So we had to have reporting around that, some sort of reporting tool to help us with understanding productivity after we have the automation in play. What's the new manual process productivity? What does that look like? Uh, has it improved? And then uh, the overall outcome of leveraging the solution, do we see a, a reduction in denials associated with, with authorizations? Are we uh, more timely in our turnaround times? Yep. And uh, as far as speaking to did we deliver, um, I think we've met every single one of those attributes that we are seeking to achieve with this solution. We lowered cost to collect um, right off the bat because we had, we focused on diagnostic imaging mm -hmm. and we had roughly 1,800 of those to, uh, to turn around in a period of 30 days. Um, with this solution, uh, it streamlined the process to where roughly 900 or so of, those, of that 1,800, about 850 to 900, uh, needed a, a manual touch still. But that's a lot of volume reduction right off the bat. And from that, just that general reduction I just described there, we're able to reduce um, our overhead by eliminating three FTEs and getting to uh, a total reduction of over time uh, that was used on a annual basis. So the, uh, the process in determining productivity, when you look at how we were doing things before, where we were um, going to all these different portals to achieve the results and doing the manual process that way, the fact that we had one way of doing it helped our education, improved our understanding, the feedback that we get from the in from the conversation, if you will, directs the person to know exactly what they need to do as the next step. It just totally streamlines that whole process, makes it more intuitive for an end user to really solve this, the problem timely. So we definitely leveraged our dashboards and, and, and looked at the productivity around all those processes. And then finally, the thing that we definitely needed to make certain that we tracked was the ability for us just to shift our resources over mm -hmm. to caring for the patient and guiding them through the whole process. 
we had to figure out if our turnaround time was going to be sufficient enough for that. And the fact that we went from concern that we even get the authorization because we want to get paid, uh, we went from that to this schedule first because we will get the authorization, totally uh, turned that turnaround time uh, around for us just by changing process. That's huge for patient experience, provider experience, and I mean, we're not talking years that this has been happening. No. This is a matter of months that, that all of this impact has, has taken place. I agree. It was a fairly low IT effort to do the first iteration, which is on diagnostic imaging. Um, you know, we pr projected about a 90 hour effort on, a, on the side of the provider, Baptist Health, and we landed right around that same number in terms of total, total time great. spent on the project. Yeah, that's great. So Jay, from a RIME perspective, you guys are working on data analytics and metrics and really helping providers and yeah. payers look at this to say, you know, what's my dashboard? How do I know if, if my program is healthy, if, I'm, if I have areas to optimize? So yeah. you want to talk a little bit about what RIME's doing there? 100%. So as, uh, as Steve was just talking about, right, that if you're going to improve a process, if you want to know if the process is working or not, you need feedback, and that feedback needs to be granular to whatever the activity is you're performing in that process. So in this case, we needed to be able to look at every prior authorization, and when we looked at a prior auth, we need to be able to understand some important information about how successful that prior authorization was. And again, this is workflow efficiency, right? So St Steve and his team are really focused on getting patients care. And to get care, we need to get the, uh, the process of getting the prior auth complete as done as quickly as possible. So one metric is really clear, time, time to care. We can see that observably on a per prior auth basis. Did we get this prior auth? Uh, did we get it completed in how many minutes? But if you want to know how much effort it was to complete that prior auth, there's not a very obvious way to do that. And without that information, you can't really start focusing on the process and understanding what you need to improve. And before, I, I want to talk about the score for just a minute, but I want to just say one thing out loud that I think I always feel like should be obvious, but maybe isn't obvious, which is prior authorizations are all very different. They're not homogeneous. People tend to think of prior auth as off or on. It works or it doesn't. You submit it or it doesn't. But there's actually a massive amount of variation, even between sometimes um, prior authorizations for the same kind of service to the same payer in regards to the quality of the data that is available to support that exchange. So it's not really possible just to look in aggregate at processing and say, is prior authorization processing working or is it not working? You really have to look at interior metrics that say, by user, by uh, ordering NPI, by modality, by class, by uh, site of care. In, in each one of those lenses, how well is prior authorization happening? And that detail, that fidelity, is what allows you to then go look at your process and say what's working and what's not working, because you can very quickly find the, the flaws or defects or problem with your process relative to that class, that subset of prior auths. So again, now we need, if we want to do that, we need to be able to, on a per prior auth basis, grade the prior auths and say, was that prior auth perfect? Was that touchless? Or was that prior auth horrible? Was that uh, a mess where we had multiple manual processes? And so we created a four-point scale. It's kind of like a, a grade point average, like a grade you would get in a class. In A, four points is if you did a fully automated touchless prior authorization. The machines did all the work. There was no human involved. It just went away. Uh, a B is when the administrative portion of that prior auth completely went away, but there was still some touch on the clinical portion, perhaps an attestation perhaps uploading a single file or answering a single question. A C, a two, is when there is a partial admin touch. So we couldn't get to the clinical moment without asking the user to fix some piece of information. And this distinction is really important because remember a prior authorization has, uh, in some cases, 70 different pieces of information attached to it. So having to fix one piece of information in your EMR 
uh, in response to a prompt is very different than having to type in 70 pieces of information in a portal. So if you have to do that, where we are in the world today, that's a one. A one is just going to a portal, typing it in. That's a fully manual effort. And what, um, again, not probably obvious to everybody, but there's not a single portal where you can go type prior authorizations in. So when you actually observe teams like Steve's processing prior auths, you will see at least 10% of the time, and sometimes more, they will go to a portal, type in a prior authorization, uh, and the portal will say, sorry, not here, go somewhere else. And then they will go type it in all again. That is an F, that is multiple manual efforts. The worst case scenario happens a lot more than we want. We want to take those away. So by assigning a score to each one, we can then aggregate those and for that class of service say, hey, we're getting a 3.5 for uh, diagnostic prior authorizations going to Florida Blue through Availity. And we are getting a 2.0 for prior authorizations and general surgeries going to this other payer who hasn't really invested in automation, which then allows everybody involved to have a, a meaningful conversation about how we improve that workflow, how we improve that case, and supports that goal of iteratively marching everybody towards touchless prior authorizations. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Jay. I think that's important, and it's it's something that you're working you know, through a tool to really to, uh, make visible to these payers and providers. Mm -hmm. So Steve, what's next? You, you've met your first round of goals. What are you looking to do with authorizations next? I want to take it across every service line tomorrow. Yeah? <laughs> All right. Noted, Jay. We've got some work to do. You know that that's do it. likely not going to happen. You've got to have a structured approach to it. So, you know, I, I could see us pinpointing um, in surgeries. There, there could be some providers, some, some procedures there that we can isolate the, the, the number of CPT codes for and leverage uh, prior off to uh, really uh, help us there. Uh, we talked about doing family practice. Um, to me, that's a the follow-up is a very simple authorization to get. Why not just go ahead and channel that through the application? Um, and then other areas like uh, therapies and oncology, that might be a little more difficult, but there's, there's, there's I believe there's um, assistance that you get just by leveraging the platform. Absolutely. And even if it doesn't go through the first time, the fact that you have streamlined the process, you made it easier to know what the next right. step is, just assists the, uh, the end user in, in obtaining what's necessary. And to what Jay mentioned, you learn from that entire process uh, from an educational standpoint on both the provider side and maybe looking at your templates looking at your order sets, uh, your procedures, what, what gets triggered out. Um, because as we found through the process, there's cleanup that's necessary to make this work well. And I think we've been able to see the success so far because between the relationships that we all have, and we've been able to bring the, the payer to the table as well, we've facilitated a lot of these conversations. So those expansion opportunities we can bring everybody to the table, have that conversation, we're able to move much faster in this end-to-end -end solution. So, we've not got much time left, but are there any questions that you guys wanted to ask? If there aren't any questions, Availity is right over at booth 2929, just behind here, right by the, the Payer Provider Connect Center. Stop by and see us, we can show you um, the different tools that we're working on. We can talk to you more about connectivity and, and what it takes. Um, all right. Thank you all. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you, Steve. Thanks, Thank you. Jay. Thank you, Sherry.